Jesus is Lord. And he was such a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> Jesus changed my life. And he's still in the life-changing business. As Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. You know, Randy, I think most people don't realize how much darkness there is it, in it the world. It can't be just coming to church and getting pumped up with the faith. You and I are all going to have to have something of faith in us. Father. Jesus died to save sinners, and you are a sinner. Shalom, and welcome back to another episode of Crosstalk. I'm Josh Weiss, and I'm really glad that you chose to join us today. I hope you'll be blessed as we go through this series. We've been talking about the topic of prayer and the devil. Last episode, we talked a bit about how we approach the throne room of God with fear and trembling and with respect, but also recognizing who we are and whose we are and who God is in relationship to us. And uh, this episode... We're going to continue that discussion, and we're going to talk a little bit about different angles in prayer. What are some different angles when we're thinking about prayer and uh, our situation? You know, I was with my pastor the other day, and we were actually at prayer. And at the end of prayer, he told a story about Corey Ten Boom. And uh, she, was, she was recounting a story when she's in the concentration camps, and she's, she's being just so annoyed by these fleas that were in the barracks and her little sister her little sister says you know Corey you, we need to give thanks to God we need to praise God for the fleas and Corey says I, I how on earth can I praise God for these fleas they're making my life miserable as if it wasn't already miserable enough how on earth why would I praise God for these fleas it was weeks later that she realized that the guards never entered their barracks, ever, because those fleas kept them out. They didn't want to go in there because the fleas were there. And so as a result of those fleas, they had a, a peace away from those guards. They were a blessing. They were God's way of blessing them. We need to look at the different angles when we're talking about prayer. And uh, we're going to do that as we dive right in. Dad's got a story for you that I think you'll find some enjoyment from. I'm reminded of, I've had many opportunities from challenges to go and talk to senators or congressmen in Washington, D.C. because I believed they were doing things, voting on things, enacting legislation that would hurt Christian TV broadcasters. Right. And so I've had the privilege of talking to a lot of them and I would do my homework before I went to see them. I wanted to know their position before I talked to them because I wanted to know, am I going into a friendly or an unfriendly? Is this going to be a hostile or is this an ally? And am I going to have to convince him of why he's wrong? Why his staff has given him bad information? Or why he's listened to the lobbyists who have an unjust reason for trying to convince them to do something that would hurt others? Or am I going into someone who already recognizes and agrees with the position that I'm, I'm taking? That's why it's important we pray in the Spirit, we draw near to God, He draws near to us, the adversary flees, and we can have the mind of Christ when we pray so that we're, we don't have to go in and convince God of what He's already convinced of. But, but on the flip side of that, that congressman or senator is likely done his homework on you as well. Mm -hmm. He's asked his staff to say, is this guy a friendly or a foe? Mm -hmm. Do we treat him this way or that way? God already has identified, he already knows, he's exactly. omniscient, he knows whether you approaching his throne is a servant as a servant of God who loves him and serves him on a day-to-day -day basis or whether or not you are not. The, the good news is you can change the mind of a senator or a congressman if you have the right argument, if you have the right facts, you can give them new information, maybe they'll reach a new conclusion unless they're in somebody's pocket. <laughs> he already has all the information he needs. God's mind is already made up and it's made up right. We need to come into agreement with God. That's the whole point of, of praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit, drawing near to Him. He will draw near to us. Our adversary will flee because he doesn't want to be anywhere near God. So, please allow me to go back to the issue of agreement, because 
it's not just my opinion. These are not my words. Jesus declared, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Jesus amplified the importance of praying with other believers. He powerfully declared, this is Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 to 20, where two or three are gathered together. In my name, there am I in the midst of them. This is important to remember. And this is something that we should pursue because Jesus says to, and it makes all the sense in the world. And I think sometimes our prayer lives are affected by the fact we just are alone and we're not praying in relationship with God through the Spirit. We're praying sort of like uncertain of what God thinks of us as opposed to coming to Him as His beloved. Praying what we know He wants to accomplish already before we ask Him because we know it's in His will. There's harmony. There's agreement. And then we often will pray and not invite anyone else to pray with us and there's therefore no agreement. And I think that also makes us a target because I think our adversary knows you're, you're more exposed when you're not in agreement. And, and there's another, I think it's an important component of prayer that should be considered. And it's the insidious effect of time. Some prayers are spoken at a point in time when we feel we're already out of time. And that's often because we make prayer the last resort, <laughs> not the first step. Yeah. So we get to this emergency and then, oh God, help me, help me, help me. As many before me have said, I want to paraphrase, God is never late but he rarely misses an opportunity to not be early. <laughs> I sort of really like that, but it's not really any sort of universal truth. We measure things in time. I think God measures things in eternity, and that's very different. There's a great offering song that was written by a folk singer I like named Jim Cole. The message is just great, and it's very simple. The lyrics to the song... So the man said to God, what's a million years to you? And God said, a second. Then the man said to God, what's a million dollars too? And God said, a penny. Then the man said to God, will you give me a penny? And God <laughs> said, sure, you'll just have to wait a second. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so recently, some of my prayers have kind of taken on the urgency of what is certainly an emergency. And it's because of my situation. But God doesn't seem to be moved by what I classify as mission critical. It's different sometimes. It seems to me like this is mission critical and if God doesn't answer this prayer in this way, the mission falls apart. God says, seriously? You just, don't know what's next. Just wait a second. <laughs> just wait a second, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Randy Weiss, and I only have about 30 seconds to tell you about my brand new book, Pray, Fight, Win. I know what you're thinking. What's the book about? It's about going on the offensive. It's about giving the devil the old one-two with your prayers. But it is so much more than that. It's a journey that we take together to find the deeper meanings within the righteousness of Christ and the treachery of the devil. I hope you'll check it out. If I can't see what's next, if I can't see the whole picture of what the mission is and what's critical to the mission, and I can't tell the difference between emergency, urgency, and wait a second, I must therefore assume that it's not his mission or the emergency is not as somehow critical to God as it feels to me. And I want to have the mind of Christ. I don't, I don't want God, I, I'm not going to change God's mind. I don't want to try and change God's mind. He's not a, an elected official with a staff being influenced by lobbyists or 27-year-old staffers. He's God. 
He's got a plan. It's a good plan. And he's, he's not getting bad information. He's not making bad decisions. He's not reaching ineffective conclusions because he doesn't have all the data. He knows exactly what he's doing. And my task is simply to trust and obey. Is it possible, you know, the two or three are gathered, right? Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of that, a lot of merit behind that comes from the fact that God, he, he believes in community, right? He Absolutely. wants us to be in community with one another. He talks about, don't forsake the fellowship of the brethren. It's not because he wants us all to be, uh, you know, at church on Sunday morning. It's because there's a strength that comes. We were created for community. There's a strength that comes in lifting one another up. Is it, is it, which by the way, I'm, I'm somewhat of a private person. Mm -hmm. I don't often share my prayer needs with friends, with, with the brethren. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't do well by that scripture of two or three gathered. I'll, I'll typically take the two or three gathered as, well, we all gather together at the prayer, you know, service at the church, or we, we, you know, there's two or three of us here and we shared our prayer request on Wednesday night Bible study. And, and then we lifted it up. And because there were multiple of uh, multiples of us there, we're all good. But I don't typically go to the extent of actually letting people in and sharing the deep prayer needs. And that's not, that's not a good way to go. Um, some of it's because of privacy. Some of it's because um, I don't want to be a baby to my, my friends. I don't want them to know the struggle or whatever else is going on. And that's not appropriate either. Is it possible that some of the, the two or three are gathered is because God may choose not to reveal something to you in the midst of it, but he will reveal something about your situation to your brother or to your sister because they can see differently and they might a different frame of mind. They're not in the emergency and the encouragement that comes from that um, is uplifting. It, it, that is absolutely true. And some circumstances are different than others. There are things that should not be shared publicly. There are things that should not be shared broadly. And you should have a certain kind of relationship with the two or three when you're going to bring them into your heart with something that might be damaging if it was communicated inappropriately by them to others. Or sometimes prayer deteriorates into gossip. Uh, often that's and that's and that's one of the things is people will use hey I just want to let you know to be praying for so and so because they're they're going through X and the truth is they're using the 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 the, the please pray for as a method to be able to say hey did you know yeah and that's and inappropriate. It's, not, it's very inappropriate right um, some of that's southern I think though you know it's sort of like uh, that's because people up north don't pray. Well, no, but I mean, so there's, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think it's kind of funny, but there are, I, I, some people, some gals in the south can, oh, I'm so sorry they didn't have that shirt in your size. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful, though. <laughs> I, I, there, so, okay, there's, I, as you know, <laughs> I went to a Christian school for for my high school and junior high years, and many times in class we would you know pray at the beginning of class, which is a good thing. I think if more schools prayed, maybe some things would be a little bit different um, in our culture and society. Um, but at the beginning, there would be the opportunity to share your prayer requests, and we still do it, you know, at church. We still do it in Bible study. People share prayer requests, and many times you'll hear some people that will say, I have an unspoken because it is of the nature. I don't want it to be gossip. I don't want everybody to know. I want to keep it private. So I'm just going to say unspoken. And so people would, people would then be able to pray for my unspoken. I don't know how they're going to pray for the unspoken because it wasn't <laughs> spoken. So what are you going to pray? Lord, Lord, whatever that unspoken is, let it be done. I mean, what do you, what do you pray? And the, the, the funny thing, there were some that would, almost take pride in saying, well, I have two unspokens. Well, I have three unspokens. I kid you not, there, there were some people in the class, every day, we would be talking about 15, 
20, 26 unspokens. <laughs> Which I'm somewhat grateful because we would take the whole class listing off all of those unspokens if we had to list them off. But, but maybe, maybe you've heard of people praying for unspokens in the context of two or three are gathering. How on earth does an unspoken help if it's unspoken within the two or three? Well, that, I think there are circumstances where someone has reasons for not disclosing the topic of their prayer request to protect themselves or their loved ones but they still genuinely want prayer. There are other times it's something else. Uh, you reminded me of something that I'm, I'm embarrassed in. Oh, please speak I, it then. It's just it's too funny. So in that same school, your baby sister uh, went to that school also. Did she? Yes, she wow, did. Wow, I didn't know that. And Interesting. As you say, they would ask for prayer. And she did. spoken. <laughs> and she, she the teacher, you know, who has prayer? And so one has this, you know, well, there's a problem with you know, something at home or who knows what, you know, little yeah. kids. And they got to your baby sister and she said, teacher, she has an older sister, as you know. Mm -hmm. she, teacher, my older sister was kidnapped. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And teacher, what? <laughs> and they called mom. It, it should have been an unspoken. <laughs> She was so, not kidnapped. No, obviously. she was not kidnapped. And so I, I, we finally got to the bottom of it. Why did you say that? She said, well, I didn't really have anything to pray about. <laughs> so you got to come, come up with something if you don't have something. Peer pressure. Yeah. Even in prayers. Yeah. <laughs> you should have taught her to just pray in the spirit. It would have been more powerful. Yes. You're right. <laughs> okay, sorry. We digress. The, the, the concept of communion, though, with one another and, and gathering together. It, it is important. And that can be both in a physical sense where you're gathering together in a prayer, uh, a prayer meeting, but it can also be where you're reaching out to those close ones and saying, will you agree with me in prayer yes. about X? Yes. And I, I do that. I am cautious with whom and when, but I do that. And sometimes the result is I have had brothers call me up some weeks later and say, Brother Randy, God told me to help you. And I would be sitting at the coffee shop studying and praying and near tears, sometimes in tears, quietly just sitting, not knowing what to do next. The phone rings and it's a brother who I had just asked him to pray for me weeks yeah. earlier, but he prayed and God spoke to him and he calls and said, God told me to help you and things change when you pray and when you pray in agreement and you pray with wisdom and understanding and sensitivity. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Randy Weiss and I only have about 30 seconds to tell you about my brand new book, Pray, Fight, Win. Now, I know what you're thinking, what's the book about? It's about going on the offensive. It's about giving the devil the old one-two with your prayers. But it is so much more than that. It's a journey that we take together to find the deeper meanings within the righteousness of Christ and the treachery of the devil. I hope you'll check it out. So two things there. One, if you're walking in the Spirit, if you're in communion with God, praying without ceasing, then you're seeking His guidance and He will direct you on who should be in agreement with you, on those people that you should be reaching out to and entrusting with that inner circle of prayer warrior needs, right? Mm -hmm. And God knows and will direct you to the people that He will also direct to help you at the time of need. In like a situation like that. On the, on the other thing, you know, number two, we are selfish. By nature of mm -hmm. being human, we are selfish individuals. And I think our journey towards progressive sanctification, our, our process of drawing closer to God, is it can be summed up in, in many ways as becoming less selfish and more selfless as we put everybody else elevating them above ourselves and God's desires above our desires, and we suppress our own needs, our own desires, because 
we're, we're becoming selfless. We're dying to self and allowing him to live in us and through us. I, I know I'm not the only one that will admit and confess that there are times people will ask for prayer mm -hmm. or that they'll, they'll list a prayer need and I might say, yes, I'll pray. Or it might even seem nonchalant in the way it's said, but I'm essentially committing to pray and then I don't pray. And I imagine there's probably times people will ask you to pray and you have to think about, I, I do, I think, do I want to commit to pray for this? Because I don't know if I will follow through with praying for this. So maybe you can help from that standpoint and just give some direction. Sure. Uh, sorry, I, I I'm would. sorry. You are probably a saint and never do that. No, <laughs> I, I'm afraid of doing that. I'm afraid of that. So last night I was at, uh, uh, at an IHOP for dinner with a couple of friends and uh, the waiter came to the table, his name was Jose. I said, well, what's your name? He said, Jose. I said, well, Jose, we're gonna give thanks and, uh, and pray, is there anything we can pray for you about? And he said, yeah. He said, uh, pray for my family. And I said, okay, uh, more specific? Unspoken. <laughs> I, I pressed him yeah. politely, you know, because I didn't know what he wanted us to pray. And I was serious, I wanted to pray for him. And I believed he needed prayer. And he said, well, for my father. I said, okay. A little bit more? Specifically? <laughs> yeah. And he said, my father's trying to stop being an alcoholic. I said, okay, we can pray. And uh, we were able to pray with understanding we were, we were able to pray in agreement. There were three Christian men together. We were able to pray immediately. I didn't want to have to think about praying for him after I got forget. back on the highway. Yeah. I wanted to pray for him right there. And I wanted him to know he's loved and that God can deliver his father. I was an addict. God delivered me. I know God frees people from their bondages. It's, it, God's able. It's not, it's enormous to Jose's father, but it's not enormous to God. It's an ask and receive. If it, I think that, that practice, if more Christians would carry that practice out, it, it would be a, an effective method of pointing people to Christ. Evangelism and sharing your faith doesn't have to be a, a constant in your face, you're going to hell conversation. Evangelism many times can begin by somebody saying, how can I pray for you? It's irrelevant what you believe. It's irrelevant where you're at in your life for me to say, how can I pray for you? And it's unlikely that somebody will not want you to pray for them. Yeah. It opens up doors and it lets them know Okay. <laughs> no, I, I don't gonna, remember the punchline. No, <laughs> so, so the night before, <laughs> I was. We had a Cuban brother in, um, a pastor. Yeah, he's for, been on the program before. Right. Well, we I took him out for dinner, and so Thanks happy to see invite. him and I his wife. That. We wanted to have a spiritual time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pray for you. <laughs> I didn't want to have the distractions have, of I, your foolish. I have an unspoken. <laughs> <laughs> So, so was, we, were, we were getting ready to eat, and, and uh, I called the waiter over, and I asked him his name, and, and I said, look, we're going to pray. I said, well, what can we pray for you? And he said... The waiter or the, the waiter. Cuban? No, no, the waiter. Okay. The, wa <laughs> the waiter says, well, uh, I'm, I'm living with my girlfriend. I said, marry her. He, he said... He said <laughs> he said, like, what? <laughs> I said, well, you love her? He says, yeah. And I said, well, I think God blesses marriage. And I don't know that God blesses living together. <laughs> and sometimes you, you sometimes prayer is absolutely, it's the right time. Other times, exhortation is what's needed. <laughs> and what did he say? Bidee, bidee, bidee. <laughs> Pretty much. So I, I, I told him, look, I, I said, marriage is wonderful. It, God blesses marriage. 
you don't have to be afraid of marriage. He says, no, I know. I've been going with this girl since high school. Since, I think he said since he was a junior in high school, they've been boyfriend and girlfriend, and he's 22 now. I said, marry her. Do the right thing. Just marry her. God bless his marriage. I said, we got married, and, and I got to tell you this, and it's personal, but it's real. I said, since 1973, apart from the six times my wife went into the hospital to have a baby, we've never spent the night apart. God bless his marriage. You don't have to be afraid of marriage. And just because people's marriages fall apart all over, that's because we live in a fallen world. It doesn't mean that your marriage has to fall apart. I mean, it's really helpful if your marriage is centered on God and He's at the core of your relationship. But he was a nice young man. He, he took the comments. Uh, if he misinterpreted it originally, he understood it before we left. Because I didn't want to leave him with, you know, thinking that I'm some kind of a smart aleck or something, because I wasn't trying to be. It's just, some things are obvious. But it is, it, it, back to the, the concept of the two or three are gathered and mm -hmm. the concept of asking to pray for people. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of merit and opportunity when you offer to pray for somebody. Just make sure you do it. Don't forget, don't make a commitment to pray and then not I agree. pray. I agree. Well, we've covered quite a bit of ground uh, on this episode of the past episodes, but even just this episode, we talked about marriage, We've talked about gossip. We've talked about uh, prayer, even when maybe other forms of help might be more appreciated. Uh, and there's even more where that comes from. Listen, perspective plays a big role. I encourage you to be encouraged by what you've heard on this, and hopefully you'll apply some of these things in your own prayer life. One thing that I hope you'll also take away is that we don't want to make commitments to people that we're going to pray for something when we're not really going to do it. And it's not... It's not a matter of just forgetting, although that's a problem. I think many times we like to say, I'll, I'll pray for that or I'll pray for you, but we really have no intention of doing so. So I encourage you this week, find two or three people and tell them, can I pray for you about this? And then immediately pray for them. Don't wait, don't put it off, do it right then. I think you'll be encouraged by the encouragement they get and you'll be encouraged by the fact that you're actually following through with your word on praying for somebody. We don't want to be uh, lax in that area. I hope you're enjoying this, this topic on prayer and the devil. I encourage you, let us know what God's doing in your life. Let us know any comments or questions you might have. You can do so at crosstalk.org. You can also do it online on social media at uh, looking for myself, Joshua D. Weiss, or my dad, Randy Weiss, and the number one, or the Crosstalk platform, Crosstalk TV. Until next time, shalom and God bless.